Good evening and welcome to the United Presbyterian Church of Plainfield, New Jersey's midweek service. As always, I thank and praise God that you have joined us and thank God for another day among mortals and another opportunity for us to spend time together studying God's word. Let us pray. Most gracious and holy Father, we come boldly and humbly before your throne of grace. Father, boldly in the blood of Jesus and trusting in his might and your word that Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, our protector is also our deliverer and the one whose blood has made it possible for us to be reconciled to you. Gracious God, humbly because we know in our own right we are not worthy of coming before your throne of grace. So we come, Lord, thanking you for this glorious day which you have provided for us for every opportunity, Lord. Father, we acknowledge that this is a day which you have made and that we are in it and we are glad for it and that we are part of your redeeming process. Oh, Father and God, we thank you so much for these things. Most gracious and holy Father, forgive our sins as we turn our attention to the reading and studying of your word. As always, I pray that you will give me fluency of speech, clarity of thought, that your spirit will permeate mine, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Father, as always, we ask you to help us see ourselves in scripture, to hear your word for us individually and for the church collectively. Let your word go forth with power and might to touch the hearts of those who do not know you yet, Lord, that they too will come to know you in the pardon of their sins and in the power of your resurrection might. Most gracious and holy Father, we ask for these things in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for living in a country where we have the freedom to speak our minds and with there is some backlash, but more freedom than many have in other countries. Father and God, we're so thankful to you for this. We thank you for the freedom to worship you as we choose to, Lord. We know that worship takes place in the heart, but also for the freedom to gather and to worship you collectively without the fear of being persecuted for that. Father, we thank you so much for this. Lord God Almighty, if we had a thousand tongues to thank you, they would not be enough, for you are gracious and kind. We thank you for your loving kindness, your tender mercies, your long suffering towards humanity. Father, we thank you so much for giving us, waking us up with our minds upon you and blessing us with a desire to pray and have fellowship with you first and then with other like-minded people. Father, we thank you so much for strengthening us, Lord, so that we are able to overcome every challenge. We thank you for your precious Holy Spirit who comforts us, Lord who guides us. We thank you, Lord, however you do it, whether it's using your angels or by whatever means, for always having a ram in the bush, Lord, so that when it seems there's no way out, you keep making ways for us, Lord. Father, we thank you that whenever the enemy shoots us down somehow, some way, your spirit lifts us back up, Lord, cleans us off and puts our feet on solid grounds. Father, we're so thankful to you for this. Father, we thank you that so far our hearts have not been overcome with the griefs and cares of this world. Father, we thank you for this, Lord. Father, we thank you for a measure of faith, Lord. Oh, Father, we say glory to your name. Hallelujah to your name, Lord. Father, we hope that you will accept our offerings of prayers, our prayers and offerings of praise and thanksgiving as a sweet smelling savor, holy and acceptable in your sight because you are so worthy, Lord. And our hearts say, hallelujah, praise your name. In the mighty and holy name of the Lord Jesus, we pray, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God in the highest. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is, who was, whoever shall be, from everlasting to everlasting, the one who changes not, the one who is no respecter of persons. Oh, thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross for the sins of humanity. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for making a way for us, Lord Jesus, to be reconciled to you. Thank you so much. Glory, hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. My brothers and sisters, let us go into our lesson. Last week, we were in Mark chapter 12, and I knew it, we probably would not get through the entire lesson last week because it was so long. Um, and so I'm going to try to get through tonight's lesson, try to get through all of chapter 12 tonight. There are several things on my heart. The announcements for this congregation you can find by going to www.upcplainfield.org and you will see our announcements there. Um, the three I would like to bring to your attention are, they are all church related and intended to build one spirit um, to facilitate all of us and each of us in our um, spiritual growth and development. That is um, early morning prayers, Monday through Friday, from 6 a.m., we try to finish at 6.15. Sometimes we go a little bit longer, but we try not to go too much longer. Please join us there, either virtually or just pray for us. If you get up and think about a 6, 6 o'clock, God bless them and all of the God's people who are up praying and asking God to intervene in the affairs of humankind. Then, of course, this service, if you have not subscribed, Please, and think about it, subscribe to us. Our goal was to hit 100. I had hoped we would do 100 subscribers by the second week of September. We're up to 98, so we only need two. If it is the Lord's will, if it is not, then it means it wasn't meant to be. But if you have not subscribed and you benefit from this ministry, it doesn't cost you any money, um, hit the subscribe button and join us as often as you can on Thursday evenings either virtually or in prayer. Even if you can't be with us, just pray for God to move by his spirit so that the truth continues to go forward and that lives are changed. Like and uh, follow us on Facebook. There we seem to be growing by leaps and bounds. You know we are a small ministry, but we have people who seem to be joining weekly. We thank and praise God for that, and we hope that they are benefiting from reading the scriptures, listening to the music, and on occasionally joining me in prayer. <clears throat> As I said before, sometimes we do announce church events. Um, I try not to list anything on that page that is not directly related to the individual <clears throat> spiritual growth of people. So there are activities going on in the church but I try not to list them on Facebook unless they are directly related to spiritual growth, unless I feel led by the Spirit. Otherwise, you can find out all of our follow us on, if you follow us on um, Sunday mornings, you will hear the announcements, but you can go to the church website and find out almost all of anything that's going on in the church will be listed there. So that concludes our announcements. What I'd like to do tonight, um, we're back in chapter 12, and I was thinking today, how do we proceed here? Last week, we went up through verse, I think, 27, uh, marriage at the resurrection is where we left off. And there are a few things I want to review with you. Um, going back to <coughs> Jesus cleansing the temple, this is a... Uh, thought that has been on my heart since that lesson. Um, that's in chapter 11, and then moving forward to chapter 12. Maybe it's in part, I'm troubled by it because <clears throat> in chapter 12, last week, we looked at paying the imperial tax to Caesar. This notion, remember um, the, the title of this section was intentionally or purposefully moving toward Jerusalem and the crucifixion or the cross. Jesus is already in Jerusalem now. And so these are the last days or weeks and days of his life. And we looked at how he is of his earthly ministry, I should say. And we looked at how he spent that time. And as I said last week, it almost seemed like a fervor um, to make sure that he got as much information to as many people 
while he was in the flesh as possible, helping them develop an understanding of what it really means to worship the living God. And um, so it seems that's what Jesus spent a lot of time doing. Of course, we know that the crucifixion was on his mind and on his heart because at least three times in the book of Mark, he talked about it, he talked about it, he spoke about his impending crucifixion with his disciples. And so it seems to me that it was almost an urgency in Jesus, I mean, I can't think of any other way to say it. I, um, I urgently need to get this information to them while I am in the flesh so they are able to receive it. And so one of the things he seemed to focus on was trying to get people to see the difference between, obviously, between the um, kingdom of God and earthly power structures, but also this, um, the difference between religious tradition and to some extent spirituality apart from the living God. It seems to me that Jesus spent a lot of his time trying to get them and us by extension to understand that there are concrete differences. And so just because one does something religiously does not mean that it is acceptable to God. And this notion with the religious leaders, he seemed to almost be, I would say if he were uh, just a man, uh, obsessed with trying to get them to see the error of their ways, the hypocrisy of how they were living. And I'm going to say, although he seemed very harsh to them at times, calling them hypocrites, what he wanted them to see was the hypocrisy of their, he wanted them to see how hypocritical they were. And he wanted them to know that having the titles and positions within the religious community and in the larger society did not necessarily endear them to God. It did not, was not a manifestation of their relationship with God. What he wanted them to understand, a relationship with God is more than doing a lot of religious things because God is concerned about the heart. That's what Jesus wanted them to understand and that's what he wanted us to understand. One of the things that uh, occurred to me, I'm not sure I made it quite clear, but when Jesus cleared the temple, there were many problems with what was going on there, but the biggest problem is the merchants and the religious leaders who were receiving monetary benefit from the selling of these goods were in error because God wasn't the focus of, it wasn't for God. It might have been for the temple, but it was not for God. The other thing that came to my mind, this is what I really wanted to say because it's, the more I thought about it and looked at it, I said, well, what is another example that we have today that would help us understand another dimension or dynamic of how horrible this practice was. Not only were they making money for themselves, enriching themselves by exploiting the religious sector that they were part of, they exploited the people terribly because they knew those people needed to buy their offerings if they couldn't bring them from wherever they were coming from, they would buy them from the merchants themselves and they would make a benefit. It was not doing a service. It was an opportunity for them to exploit the people. And I thought, what in today's society might we use as an example? Well, one example would be people who, if people would do this, would take a church directory for example, and use that church directory, the names in that list, to profit for themselves, and I'm going to say even for the church, 
because when there is a church directory, it is for members to be able to communicate with each other for spiritual reasons, whether it is for fellow for fellowship, for um, sharing joys and concerns, <clears throat> um, things like that. But in fellowship, but it is not intended for a person or a group of people to take the list then and use it to make money under the guise of doing something religious. That is, in essence, what those merchants did in the um, temple courts. And so that was, I mean, it's almost as though they had no fear of God or no understanding of the wrongfulness of what they were doing. They were exploiting the people, but more importantly, they were exploiting God for their own gain. My brothers and sisters, this is heartbreaking. When we get to chapter 12, and we get past the tenets, and we look at this whole interaction between Jesus and the religious leaders, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the scribes, they were looking for ways to undermine Jesus because Jesus had upset. Not, I don't know if he purposely, he brought attention to the wrongfulness of what these people were doing. And um, even the question, remember what I asked last week or made the suggestion, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were not close. They were diametrically opposed to each other. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, and the Pharisees did. There were other differences, but that was a big difference. So usually they were on opposite sides of the camp. And I remember saying, you know, um, sin makes strange bedfellows. And so they came together to try to bring, they brought their power together to try to stop one man who did not want their positions, who only wanted to show them a better way. And when I say a better way, he wanted them to understand what true worship is and how it's done. And so at times he became, um, in the temple, of course, he was irate. But at other times, he was very forceful with them, very forward with them, because it seems to me that's all they would understand. Um, he tried to reason with them, as the talent says, the story of the talents. He tried to reason with them. And instead of them looking at his message with eyes that said, I want to be right, they looked at it, it seems to me, as to, in two ways of saying, not only do we want to squash him, we have to squash the message because the message is one that makes us uncomfortable. It makes, us, it, makes it sound like we're not really worshiping God. And of course, that is exactly what Jesus was saying. Here we end up today with a person who says, let's look at verse 28 the greatest commandment. Let's look at this. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Now, well, let me finish reading. Finish reading. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Verse 32. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. 
to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to the man, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Now let's look, as is our custom in this study for now, look at what actually happened. The man approaches Jesus and probably asking out of a sincere heart because of Jesus' response. Remember, this is how we make um, inferences and draw conclusions. We look at what the text actually says. We look with rational eyes or through the eyes of faith to try to make some kind of um, assessment. And so what we can say is it appears that the man was sincere because of the way Jesus finally answered him. You are not far from the kingdom of God. So we can assume that he came and he asked the question not to put Jesus on the spot as the Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees had done. Remember, their purpose was to embarrass him, to entangle him, to cast doubt upon his message, upon his character. Um, that was their intention, to throw him off. Um, but this man seemed to come sort of like Nicodemus, one who had heard the message and wanted sincere answers. This is why I stressed before, and I think scripture stresses, when it says the religious leaders, it doesn't mean every single one of them were opposed to Jesus. Um, and so this seems to be one of them. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, heard them debating with Jesus. And he was impressed with the answer that Jesus gave. Now let's look at this man. He had to have the right heart. I want to hear not just what I want to hear. I don't, I want to receive the truth. I don't only want to Jesus to say what I want to hear. I want to know the truth. And if we're going to quote scripture, scripture, it would say, I want to know the truth so that I can live right and be set free because the truth is what sets you free. How does this work? All of these commandments that remember they had many, but he wanted to know, okay, of those 10 commandments, forget about all the others that we have imposed upon people. Which of these is the most important Lord? So he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? I just want to know, because I know I can't keep them all. You see, now we're inferring. I know that I can't keep them all, and even if I can say I can keep them all, I know that not everyone can. And so as a teacher, I want to be right when I talk to people. When someone asks me, what should I say to them? Well. If they say, you know, I can't keep them all. So what does that mean? That it's over for me? Jesus answers him. Think about the difference in the way Jesus answers this man and the way he answered the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Let's look at his answer to this teacher of the law who asked what I believe is probably from a sincere place. Which of these is greatest? Because I know I can't do them all. Jesus says, the most important one is this. And then he quotes, to love the Lord thy God first with, their entire, with your entire being and to love your neighbor as yourself. Think about how he starts there. It is here. It is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's the way he begins. But look at how he answered the Sadducees, who didn't believe in resurrection and wanted to know about whose wife someone would be if she had married multiple brothers, and look at how he answers them. He says, are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? Are you not in error? You see, in other words, you're in error, either because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. Listen to the difference in the tone, his response to the sincere man who wanted to know about the greatest commandment for either for himself or as a teacher of the law or for both. Look at his response to the Pharisees and the scribes on paying taxes. He says to them, 
Why are you trying to trap me? You see. And so we have to assume that this man, who was a leader, went to him and said, you know, I don't really have an answer. I really want to know. I can't keep all of these commandments. And even though I might have kept all 10 of them, what do I say to people who honestly come to me and say, you know, I can't do it? Jesus says, here's what you tell them. Do these two things. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. One God. You cannot worship many gods. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Love him with your entire being. And love your neighbor as yourself. He says, that's it. If you do these two things, everything else comes under those umbrellas, one or the other. It was true for them. Now we're looking at application. It is true for us. In this book we're reading in the morning, The Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence, reminds us as we're looking at this man's life. Remember he lived in the 1600s. As we read through this book, I am reminded, and I think those who come in the morning are reminded of this scripture. Love the Lord with your entire being because one of the things that book emphasizes, that's emphasized in that book, that Brother Lawrence had to learn to train his mind to think about God constantly so that he was aware of God's constant presence. You see, God is always with us. The more we are aware of his presence, his mercy and his grace, the more deeply we come to love him. Our love for him grows. That's what I will say. Our love for him grows. It begins the moment we realize, we like to say in the tradition I'm from, the moment we are aware of salvation, the moment that God touches our hearts and changes the way we think, and from the, the way we think, our behavior changes. We desire primarily to please him. That's our goal. It isn't just to go to church, but we long to be in the presence of God. To be in that place where we are aware of God's presence. That's what God was saying. That's what Jesus was saying here. We get to a point where that's what we want. We don't look for ways to try to exploit the gospel, the things of God, that means the facilities and the people for our own benefit. Instead, we look for ways. We acknowledge that whatever we have is a gift from God that has been entrusted to us to be used to his glory and to the upbuilding of his kingdom. That's what begins. It inspires in us a reverence for God. Things that we once did without thinking that were antithetical to the word of God. And we did so without any remorse or recrimination. We just did it. That doesn't happen once we come into the saving knowledge of the Lord. Our spiritual eyes are opened. Before then, we were pretty much like, Saul on the road to Damascus. And then our eyes are opened so that we too begin to cry out, oh, wretched person that I am. You see, it is, and the love of God is stirred up in us the more because we are aware now, although God has always been there. Sin had a veil between us and the Lord, and we couldn't see him. And so we went about rituals 
But there was no love for God. That's in a way I think what the teacher of the law was asking Jesus. And Jesus, thank God, answered it so perfectly. Here's all you have to do, young man. This is what he's saying to each of us. This is all you have to do. Love the Lord with your entire being. Books like The Practice of the Presence of God help us figure out, look at how other people have done it. Everybody doesn't have to read that. That's just the book that I'm on today. You could say it's the flavor of the month or the time. Dietrich Bonhoeffer's books are the same, and there are many. Reading the Bible in different translations and dialects helps to help us figure out how do I love you the more. When we realize that we have been saved from the penalty and consequences of sin, whatever that means, and we believe it means, not to be eternally separated from God our Father. This is why the 23rd Psalm, when you think about the power of it, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Or the Psalms that talk about under the wings of the Lord, of God Almighty. I think it's the 96th Psalm. To be separated from God is just too painful. And so we're so grateful that we have this reverence and our love for him grows. The more we meditate on what we were and where he's brought us from, the more grateful we are. It isn't because of money or power or position, none of those things. And as we grow to love God, the more we reflect the love of God. God is love. We reflect the love of God. That means we care about God's creation. We care about other people. We care as much about them as we care about ourselves. We don't want to hurt God and we don't want to hurt others. We don't want to exploit God. We don't want to exploit others. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. We have a burning desire to submit our wills, to bring them under subjection, to bring every thought into captivity. So that God alone occupies the throne of our hearts. And when we are aware that something is off kilter, there is a sadness, but a determination to ask God to help us to get back up, to move over, to be open, to be vulnerable, to be real with God, not to hide it, not to try to justify it, not to see how far we can stay on the fringes without coming in. We want to be all in. We don't want to be on the fringes. We want to please God and we want to help others. My brothers and sisters, that's as far as we're going to get tonight. Now, um, let me, let's skip, well, no, let me go over to the Messiah. Let's try to get through this. Whose son is the Messiah? The Messiah, there was this, these people were looking, as always, for a way out. Not trying to acknowledge that Jesus was both God and man, but that instead, um, you know, they had just like we do, they look for excuses to discredit, they looked for excuses to discredit Jesus. And Jesus wanted them to know that he was both God and man. And that's why he said to them, while Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, 
Why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? Why do they say that? The Messiah, why do they say that? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? You see, these factions that went on between the, the tribes of Israel and this emphasis on the tribe of Judah, although it is, remember I told you before to look in Matthew, and it's important to see the lineage to know that that is the J from Abra from who Adam all the way to Jesus, how it happened through the tribe of Judah. But he wanted them to know this emphasis that you all are putting on this, making this into this political battle for an earthly kingdom is wrong. My kingdom is not even of this world. So when you're invoking David's name, think about that in the context of the scripture. David was a man as you are. Anyway, warning against the teachers of the law. Let's look. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Here he goes again pointing out their hypocrisy. He says, yes, they want all the outward adulations. I'm a minister. I'm the right reverend, the right reverend so-and-so. I'm reverend doctor so-and-so. I'm pastor so-and-so. I'm evangelist so-and-so. I'm an elder in my church. I'm a deacon in my church. I'm head of the Sunday school. I've done these many programs. He said, yeah, they like all of that. But here's what they lack. They don't want to do anything that really helps other people. Look at the example he uses. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. They won't even help the most needy people in the community. You see, they will set up programs for them. They will say to the widow, you have to pay a certain tithe to be a part of our group, or if not a certain tithe, you have to give. However, even if that giving means that it's going to cause you extreme harm, and that's not what God meant, you're obligated to do it and will not lift a finger to help those people. You see, to provide for their essential needs. Oh, they'll coordinate things, but if it requires them to go get the food, to take the money out of their own pockets, to buy food, to pay rent, to buy clothing, for someone else without fanfare, they won't do it. They will coordinate meetings, but when it comes time to actually impacting the quality of life for people, the widows and widowers were the most, widows were the most, and, and orphans were the most vulnerable people in the society. Jesus said, you know, it's all hypocrisy because they've missed the boat. I just told you two of the greatest commandments are to love the Lord with all of your heart, your entire being, and to love your neighbors as thyself, as thyself. Not only those neighbors who can do something for you, the ones who can't give you anything. They can't give you a job. They can't give you, they can't lift you up or point you to a position. How do you treat the least among you, the ones least liked? How do you treat them? They do all of these things. They get all dressed up. They wear their robes. They give these long prayers. He uses the word banquet. Every event, they're stunting and fronting, or fronting and stunting, however it goes, but they're getting photo ops. 
But when it comes time to doing the will of the Father, if they don't see any benefit for themselves, they will not do it. What does that benefit mean? Sacrificing to ensure, to use the gifts that God has given them to facilitate others. Look at the order in which he's, these things are being presented. The question about the greatest commandment is trying to squash the disputes about David and this division, artificial division between the tribes. We might say denominations. Warning against the teachers of the law those in positions of power within the religious community who twist the gospel for their own benefit. And it is almost always, always for power of some kind, whether it is monetary power or power in the medium of exchange, whatever it is at any given place and, and time, whether it is for prestige to be lauded and exalted and looked at and have words heaped upon them. Or for prestige. He says, look at them. They do all of these things. And yet they don't do the simple thing. They don't really love God because if they loved God, they would also love their neighbors as themselves. They would be concerned. They would say, there's no way I can go on vacation knowing that there are people spending thousands of dollars on a vacation when I know there are people in my family who have needs, their basic needs being met, not being met. There's no way I can turn my back on people knowing that they have a need. These men or people will be punished most severely. Jesus would say they're hypocrites. They're pimping the gospel. Using it for their own good. In some ways they almost are on the verge of committing blasphemy, calling the things of God, attributing the things of God to the devil and attributing the things of the devil to God. Well, we don't have to do that. God doesn't matter. God's on the back burner. It's almost though they have lost sight of the fact that they, God is everywhere present. They say it, but they don't believe it because if they, when we believe it, it changes our behavior. It changes our thought process first, our thoughts about our relationship to God, then our relationship to others. The widow's offering, and then we're finished with chapter 12. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Sacrifice. Jesus paid it all. She didn't give to be saved. She wasn't trying to buy her relationship with God, we can assume. Some will say, well, what was her point, Pastor? Her point was she had been taught to give to the temple. And maybe she didn't have whatever the particular offering was that they, the temple required. And so with great faith and reverence, God, I don't have what the temple requires. 
but I'm giving you the best that I have. This is all I have. I give it in reference to you. To your glory and for the upbuilding of your kingdom. That was it. She gave, it's like saying, you know, I don't, I'm just using this as an example. I only get $2,000 a month. By the time I pay all my bills, I don't have anything else to give. She gave, that's what it would be like. Instead of saying, I don't have anything else to give, she would have said, instead of buying a pizza, I'm giving it to God. Instead of, I'm using fast food because now you see what I like to eat out. Instead of buying, having a meal catered in, I'm giving it to God. Instead of buying a new pair of shoes, I'm giving it to God. I can't give thousands of dollars, but Lord, I give you what I have, and that's good enough for Jesus. She gave out of a sincere heart. That's what God requires of us, a sincere heart, a heart that is sincere in worshiping him, Worship and reverence go together. In reverencing him, we acknowledge that he is creator, redeemer, and sustainer, not just of all things, including us. Those all things include us. That he is the one who created us in his image and for his good pleasure. That we are bought with a price. We have been given free will. to choose between good and evil, to choose to serve God or to reject him. Reverence includes a grateful heart, one that acknowledges God's graciousness, his mercy, thanking him for the small things, acknowledging his presence, wanting to please him, wanting to love him. And being grateful for forgiveness of sin. My brothers and sisters, that concludes our lesson for tonight. I pray that you have found it meaningful. May the spirit of the living God continue to rest, rule, and abide with each of us. May God grant us hearts of compassion and hearts that love him wholly. May God stir up in each of us a desire to love him more and to please him. May God grant us spiritual discernment, spiritual courage to do the right things for the right reasons, even when it is unpopular to do so. May God grant us the courage to look at ourselves honestly and submit ourselves to him and ask the question, God, maybe not ask the question of, our, of him about ourselves, but ask this question, God, help me to serve you. Help me to love you the more. That's where I leave you tonight. The Lord willing, I hope to see you on Sunday morning at our services, at our service, 11 a.m. service on Sunday morning, either virtually or in person. God bless you. Remember, God loves you. Jesus died for you. The Holy Spirit is able and willing to keep you. And if you should fall, he will pick you up, turn you around, clean you up, and set you back on solid ground. God bless you. We at United care very much about you. Good night.